guys. Thank you very much. Hope Thank you enjoyed you. the flight. Cheers. Today we'll get you up in the tower down in the radar room just to give you an overall picture of what we try to achieve here at NAT Manchester and also to learn a bit about the airspace and why it's really important you know, to stay outside of control airspace uh, unless you've got that ATC clearance and, and just the impact it gives across the whole aviation community. Really. We're really excited to have a look around. I've never been to an air control tower like this before. I've been up in Blackpool's tower but it's a little bit different to that. So Barton is just over there, you've got Winter Hill with a large mast and just uh, to the left of that is the Barton uh, airfield and as you're rooting into the overhead at Barton you can often see aircraft being pushed back off the stand here, you can see the tails actually moving so that shows how close we are, particularly where the city centre is there as well. So. Right, welcome to the tower. Um, so, give you a quick overview of all the different positions we have up here. So, first of all, the tower assistant. So, this position looks after the, like, the flight planning, the, or the weather. Uh, the main, the main part is the weather reporting, uh, and then also any kind of incoming outgoing messages from the tower. Basically, to take away any of the uh, extra communications from the controllers. Uh, and then next, we have uh, ground movement planner. So, this is where the uh, the pilots fir very first call up on the tower to get their initial uh, routing to find out of any uh, slot restrictions uh, due to that, could be due to uh, weather, the you know, other airports, etc. etc. Uh, so when uh, they've got the clearance and uh, the planner is happy that uh, the departure controller or the ground controller can accept the aircraft, they get transferred up to the ground controller, which is here. So uh, where Andy's sat now, basically it looks after all of the airfield on the ground apart from the runway. So it's a huge, huge job. Uh, they've got all the way from down there, all the Two, two, three, three. Massive, massive responsibilities. Probably the busiest and the hardest position at the airport, um, and also is the one that can kind of make or break the operation. So this, this individual needs to be really on the game, you know, planning ahead, making sure there's no conflictions. Uh, not a lot going on at the moment, as usual, uh, when we have visitors. But uh, there's a lot of um, uh, pinch points on the airfield where there's only a single uh, taxiway in, single taxiway out, so they have to not wait for anyone to pass. As you can see, the very far end, we've got a lot of construction. That's the Manchester Transformation Project. Uh, part of that transformation is going to be new taxiways, which is going to free up a lot of capacity on the ground, a lot of dual taxiways so we can pass aircraft independently of each other. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be a massive game changer for us. Um, so, when Andy's finished with the, uh, the aircraft on the ground, uh, go outbound towards the runways, he passes it to the air controller. In this configuration, we're in dual runway ops, so we're landing on 2 3 right departing of 2, 3 left uh, and that's the, the main configuration for us in the summer. Uh, so Stu's job basically is to cross the aircraft uh, outbound to the departure runway whilst uh, knitting them in between the arrivals. So the arrivals roughly spaced every four miles apart depending on the weight vortex but uh, if there's no vortex implications it's four miles apart which is just enough room for us to land an aircraft, vacate it whilst crossing another and by the time the aircraft has crossed and cleared the runway the inbound will be around about a mile final. And that's quite good. close. Yeah, but it's a good good distance for us to, to yeah. give landing clearance. Smaller airports, quieter airports, probably have a bigger um, margin for uh, landing, uh, but we go for about a mile. Completely uh, safe, we, you know, we've gone through all the procedures, we're happy with that mile, it works well. It's about 30 seconds or something. Yeah, so. about that, yeah. So, uh, so when you sit and watch, you know, aircraft constantly moving. Uh, so, so when Stu's finished, you can see an aircraft just going across there. Uh, he'll he'll transfer that when it's clear of his runway over to Dave, who does Air 2, which is Air Departures. Uh, so Dave's job is solely to uh, depart the aircraft in the most efficient uh, order possible. So he's going to be looking at the different routes, the different wing vortexes, different speeds of the aircraft, and just separating those aircraft to get them airborne as quickly as possible uh, in, in the, the most efficient, most safe uh, route. Uh, various things can affect that position, uh, be that weather, so if there's some, uh, some weather on the final approach, 
the aircrew don't necessarily want to fly the SID. He's got to coordinate with our on-route colleagues up in Presswick in Scotland. He's got to get some different routings. Um, and also, um, any obstructions in the airspace, and that could be a zoning fringer. So if the zoning fringer, <laughs> we, we can't uh, fly in that area. We've got to maintain three nautical miles and 3,000 feet from the aircraft, mm. which um, for something we don't know where it's going, is a very, very hard challenge. So a zoning fringer effectively stops departures. Uh, so, so Dave there cannot launch his outbound, therefore he backs up. Stu can't uh, cross his outbounds because it backs up and they can't push anything. The whole airfield basically comes to a stop. And then that's just the air traffic side of things. If you can imagine what the terminals then, the delays. Yeah, it's a huge knock-on effect. Yeah, yes, and their security. It's the bigger picture for us in air traffic, we, we generally see the aviation world in eventual airplanes. But when you go back behind the scenes, you've got your security, you've got car parks, yeah, the terminal uh, facilities. So it, it just it's a full knock-on effect for us all. Right, so we've seen the, uh, the VCR, the tower, so now it's the... Uh, approach control, so this is basically where all the inbounds get fed to the tower. Uh, the outbounds go straight up to, uh, to Presswick Centre, so when the approach don't get involved in the outbounds, but all the inbounds into Manchester come through this room, so let's have a look. We've got three positions in the uh, approach room. Approach south, this is the main position, so this handles uh, predominantly all the inbounds from the initial, uh, the initial holding points. So we've got uh, two holds to the north, one to the south, so all our inbounds route via one of those three holds. And they get sequenced into the ILS, predominantly for the ILS uh, in Manchester. When it's quiet, Approach South can do it all the cells. When there's uh, a couple or more on frequency, they get split, and then we get what we call the, the final director. So uh, the, the FIN, as, as we say, um, is responsible just to basically tight sequence the aircraft to get that four mile space in on the nose every single time. And to put the finesse really, so uh, approach south, basically set the aircraft up, fin, um, get the finesse, get the uh, get the nice sequencing going. Right, so here's the main radar screen then, so we obviously, there, right in the middle, we've got other areas like uh, Liverpool Airport, leads up to the uh, the northeast. Um, the final approach tracks, that's basically the alignment of the runways with uh, various markers showing uh, various uh, distances from touchdown, and obviously you can see the aircraft uh, flying around the sky and we've got the, the A380 there on a 10 mile final. We came in from up in the northwest here and then routed towards sort of Lee Flash then into Sail Water Park before turning in for two, three rides. Yeah, I mean, so you did the right thing there, you, you, you routed via the uh, the published uh, VRPs, you know, especially like, like the Lee Flash, Sail Water Park, really good obvious uh, places to, to use uh, and so there's various tools, I mean we've got a, got a great website out there now which shows you all the, uh, the VRPs in good detail. What's the website that David? It's Airspace Hub. Airspace Hub, yeah, UK. that's a, that's a yeah. fantastic resource and also NAT Sky by Numbers is a new initiative uh, to basically make not only pilots but the general public aware of, of airspace and what it is, so that's another good good one to look at, the sky by numbers. And looking at the radar here, where are the sort of places, if I was flying the local area, I should really watch out, are there any sort of catch points which yeah. get, end up getting a bit too near the airspace? Yes, I mean the, the, big, the big one for us um, is, is the low level corridor which is here, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange bit of airspace where we allow aircraft to fly through. Uh, our airspace without actually having a clearance from air traffic to 1300 feet on the, on the Manchester QNH, which is a really important point in the Manchester QNH. So you might be on the regional pressure setting, but if you, uh, you could then inadvertently bust vertically into the control airspace. Uh, so it's really important that you dial up that Manchester uh, ATIS um, and get the, you know, the QNH or call Manchester radar. So looking up here now, there's a 7365 squawk. There's actually two of them. Yeah. Um, well, I'll. I'll I'll hand that over to David, he's probably the better to talk about that one. Yeah, absolutely. So in the past, we never used to have a squawk at Barton. We just used to use 7,000. Of course, on a busy day, we can have 20, 30 aircraft on frequency. If an aircraft infringed controlled airspace, we'd get a call from Manchester Radar and say, are you working an aircraft at Lee Flash? Well, we never knew, even though we've got 20, 30 aircraft on frequency on the basic, and we've got no radar to see them. So what we introduced is this squawk, which was from Manchester's allocation of 7365. Now, pilots should only select that code when they're instructed to do so by the FISO at Barton. Barton information, good afternoon, number 477 Echo Uniform, request join. Number 477 Echo Uniform, Barton information, good afternoon, patch message. Number 477 Echo Uniform, Cirrus SR22, Biggin Hill to Blackpool. We're currently just passing the M56 junction, altitude 1,200 feet on 1030, request for heavy information. Number 7 Echo Uniform, runway 08 left, circuit left hand. QFE 1028. Squawk 7365. 08 left, circuit left hand, QNH 
um, and that shows the radar control at Manchester that aircraft is in two-way communication with us. We know who that aircraft is, what the aircraft type is, where they are, what altitude they're at and what their intentions are. And that's the only time when we put that spark on an aircraft when we know all that information. Therefore, if an aircraft does get a bit too close to controlled airspace or does accidentally infringe airspace, Manchester know for a fact that the aircraft is talking to us. They can ring straight through to our earpiece, maybe get even the registration on the mode S, and then we can call the aircraft and get marked controlled airspace. So if an infringement does occur, it may only last 10, 20 seconds, which still has an impact, but in the past, if we had an aircraft out there that was on 7,000, it could be working us or it might not be working us, and that infringement could have lasted a lot longer and had a much bigger impact on Manchester. So it's just a, a simple squawk code to let not just Manchester, but Liverpool, Walton, Leeds, Scottish Control, everybody know that the aircraft is talking to us. So let's say I'm um, routing back, I've been on a land away and I'm heading back to Blackpool, mm -hmm. uh, just going up to sort of the southern section here. What's best to do? Am I best to get a basic service on Manchester, or would you advise just going on to the listening squawk and transiting through? So it's really down to your own preference. You need to service you would like. Um, obviously that service you end up getting depends on the control of the workload. If we can give you a traffic service we will, if not we'll put you onto a basic service. But first and foremost I recommend, uh, well just plead with you, use your transponder. Now in the, in the modern age of Mode S, uh, if we click on, oh it just disappeared, click on an aircraft there, there's a good chance a Mode S data, if it's a Mode S equipped aircraft, will fit in this box. Look, there's the reg. Oh wow. So G, G Saffer there, no, you can find the reg. So if he's got the Manchester listening out code on, we can then call him that call sign and speak to the aircraft. So it's, it's a really useful tool. It's yeah. so something we really recommend to any pilots in the local area who don't necessarily want a service or even a zone clearance, just put that listening out code on. So we're all about to climb through a little hole and go and have a look outside on the balcony of the tower. Now out on the balcony on the control tower at Manchester and just having a little look at where we taxied in. Funny thing is the airport looks absolutely huge out here and it's amazing just seeing how many people are down the ground and what is actually going on, which is an awful lot. Um, so Dave, I think we, we landed on 2-3 right, didn't we, just over there? That's right, yep, yeah, 2-3 right there. And then we vacated down here at Bravo Delta. So it didn't have the follow me car then just stand six by. So it doesn't look so far up here, but um, if you look at the it, size of the people down there, it was a pretty long taxi, wasn't it? It was a very it? long taxi, yeah. Like you say up here, it almost looks like just a little um, a play mat, doesn't it? Like yeah, it's yeah. It's a play mat, but no, it's absolutely huge. And then so we've got a uh, good old uniform kilo hidden just around the corner around there. Um, and we just like to come and have a look up here and just try and get, understand a bit more about the size and uh, scope of the airfield. So that's the new taxiway they're actually laying at the moment, that work in progress area. And you can see the new taxiway actually curving in and the concrete's going to be laid soon so it'll allow them to have another taxiway through because that bit gets a little bit congested at times. North, we've got Barton Airport, very close to controlled airspace, you can actually see it from the tower. And just out to the west of us is where the low-level route runs. It's a really clear data, you can actually see quite a lot of the VRPs, and it's really, really close to the edge of the, uh, the airspace here. So just off to the west, we've got the Frodsham and the Frodsham Hills in the Liverpool airspace, and we've got Jodrell Bank on the edge hill as well, as you can see. And that shows really just how close the airspace uh, is to the low-level route. That those hills are the opposite side. Thanks a lot for having a quick chat with us, Sam. Good to see you. Sorry to grab you, but I just thought it'd be really good to share um, a bit more about being an air traffic controller. Yeah. Obviously the channel's really flying oriented, but we have to talk to air traffic controllers as we yeah. fly along. I've been here two and a half years at Manchester, and I spent a year at the college down in Fairham, and that's got headquarters down there, so we trained down there for a year beforehand. So you spend a year down there, and then I spent about another year at Manchester, finishing my training on the job, so you're working, but with someone sat beside you. 
and they're just they've got ultimate control. So if you do do anything wrong, obviously they step in. They're making sure everything's safe for the whole time. Um, for people who are into aviation, it's a great alternative to flying. I mean, you see you around aircraft all day long, and you're looking out the window, the best view of an airport as you can have. Um, but as I say, great career, and that's a great company to work for, and it's something I definitely recommend getting into. And for the guys that are sort of uh, about to leave school or university, what sort of qualifications do you need to apply for that? So is it is it just sort of like core skill base? What, what do you need? Yeah, so it's definitely more skill based. You just need five GCSEs, A to C. I think it's got to include English and maths, and that's it. You don't need A levels. You don't need to go to university. It's all it's how your brain works. It's how your brain functions. So it's spatial awareness. It's under turning a two D picture into a three D image in your head and trying to imagine where everyone is. So that's why there's not the academic limits on it because they understand that it's not just about footwork, it's about how your mind works. Now finished at the air traffic control tower and we're going to nip over to have a look around the fire section which is going to be really really interesting and see what sort of uh, things that those guys do day to day. Raul here is sorting out for us to go in one of the ops cars and have a look around the airfield and he's wanted to tell us a little bit more about the role of the operations team. Hi, I'm Raul Mia, I'm part of the airfield operations team here at Manchester. Um, part of our role is um, looking after all activities at airside, both safety and performance. And I'm glad uh, Ben's come on board and uh, will be promoting airside safety. Thanks a lot, it's a real privilege to be able to get airside and have a look around um, from this sort of perspective. Basically, in a nutshell, basically we look after the safety and integrity of the airfield, okay? And that covers everything that goes on on the airfield. So all the um, the procedures uh, as to do with we do runway inspections, taxiway inspections, aircraft docking, aircraft marshalling. We look after the bird control. We'll have someone assigned to a bird control uh, duties every day. 24 hours a day. Are you able just to drive around here without asking where you go? You just have to. Yeah. Well, we um, we have what's called free ranging facilities. Okay. So so basically, we don't. As long as we are monitoring ground, which is obviously this radio here, as airfield ops, we're allowed to just drive around wherever we want to go without any permission. So we we call it free ranging. So we. Basically that's it, we don't need a call up. So we're now just working our way around the perimeter fence we're going to head down, sort of halfway down runway 23 left. And there's an Airbus A380 about to depart, so we're going to get really up close with that and see what it looks like. It's really interesting actually going around the airfield in the operations car here and seeing how busy the airfield is. It's a sort of perspective you don't get, I think, from flying in and around the local airspace. Or even if you're on the terminal about to go on holiday, seeing the amount of things which go into making this sort of whole operation happen is incredible.
be outside of the ops car and see the scale of the airfield. We've driven probably now about 10 miles around the airfield. Down by the 2-3 right threshold, just waiting for an Etihad 787 to come in. Just on a sort of a one mile final now. Pretty sure the passengers will be disembarking as well now and this is the sort of thing which an infringement will do if you bust that airspace by 100 feet then it's going to cause this knock-on effect this aircraft could have been delayed could have had to go around and then all these passengers are late they're late for their next flight all the crew here are waiting for the aircraft it's got to have a shorter turnaround time now which is going to create all these knock-on effects just from that sort of lack of uh, airmanship and getting a bit too close to control the airspace Blackpool in the Cirrus. The flight time back isn't too long at all, so we're going to be about half an hour. Um, what an amazing day looking around Manchester Airport. It's really exciting to get in the radar room, tower, have a look around the fire section, and also go in an ops car and drive pretty much the whole way around the airfield. 